very good morning everyone welcome to indian strategic astrology master class with yet another talk on how do you manage the psychosis but last week uh, we had a talk on very common gi symptom belching hiccups and bronchitis and this lecture was delivered by dr amit datta and this was a mastery lecture on uh, these common symptoms i hope you enjoyed listening to dr amit datta thank you amit for a wonderful lecture this week uh, uh, we have a uh, chosen a topic which is uh, extremely common uh, that is ascites although we know as i much about ascites and we treat uh, in our clinical practice every day uh, but we thought that uh, there are certain points we wanted to highlight uh, in uh, malignant ascites and some of these points will be highlighted by dr uh, by the speaker today and the speaker today is uh, dr akash sukla dr akash sukla is a dear friend and he is a professor and uh, professor and head of gastroenterology at the km hospital in mumbai and uh, he is a very renowned speaker the clarity of thought he has on the topic he speaks uh, is remarkable and we look forward to listen to dr akash on this topic uh, dr akash will discuss mainly about uh, uh, ascites which associate with cirrhosis and he will just uh, go over a uh, general approach to ascites and to moderate this session we have uh, yet another a uh, legend dr manoj sharma dr manoj sharma is a professor of uh, hepatology at uh, ILBS in New Delhi again that Manoj uh, is very esteemed uh, teacher and uh, very learned uh, hepatologist uh, with this uh, i welcome all of you again and uh, i request dr saraswat uh, to speak to you and then he invite uh, dr akash sukla for the talk dr saraswat please you are muted sir sir you are muted. yes Uh, thank you very much, Govind. Uh, good morning to all the participants and viewers uh, all over the country and uh, from our neighboring countries. It's been about three and a half months now since we have been running the ISG masterclass, and it is as ever it is heartening to see the constant, uh, committed participation that we have from our audience. Our numbers have stabilized somewhere between eight hundred to thousand uh, participants for every live session. and we have a core commit uh, group of uh, or the audience who we see on every master class asking a lot of questions and it is encouraging to see that they find that they are benefiting from this and thus they keep coming back to our sessions i think one of the key things that has held the attention of people is that our focus has been on common problems problems that we deal with regularly and uh, we have had excellent presentations from the top notch speakers from the country uh, in these last 3 and a half months in this uh, 22nd presentation in this series today we'll be talking about ascites as professor makaria just said ascites is an extremely common and most people think it of it as a very straightforward presentation and one uh, in your early years you think there are few things easier to manage than a cirrhotic patient with ascites you simply have to give him a few tablets and a drugs and uh, the fluid mobilizes promptly well as you go along and as i've said repeatedly to my residents uh, who've been through sdpgi i think the ultimate test of how good a hepatologist you are is how well you manage your ascites patient without swinging on the one hand from the extreme of large tense ascites requiring paracentesis on the other hand to a dry dehydrated comatose patient with kidney injury uh and not just how you well you manage because the number of drugs are limited the insight into the topic is very important and your ability to communicate this to your patient so that your patient is able to do good self monitoring at home is probably equally important to avoid complications and to take us through all these complexities of what is otherwise considered a very straightforward topic we have professor akash shukla i have known akash now for what 12 15 years akash and it's been a great pleasure to watch his uh, moving up the academic uh, ladder to heading the department of gastroenterology at the km hospital mumbai he's a well recognized figure on the gastroenterology hepatology scene in india and akash not only has he grown in his uh, academic stature but he has grown otherwise also in other dimensions also uh, 
I think whenever I go and visit him in Mumbai, it's one of the things I look forward to is the different eateries we go to, and everywhere Akash has uh, commands uh, a unique uh, uh, his presence, immediate attention and service. So if you wish to enjoy yourself in Mumbai, Akash is the man for you. So with these few words, Akash, I think we look forward to listening to your usual incisive presentations and uh, um, uh, to take us through this topic of ascites. Over to you, Akash. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's indeed a pleasure to be uh, giving this talk in presence of uh, Professor Saraswat, who has done such uh, pioneering work uh, in ascites. And uh, also, I would like to acknowledge the contribution of uh, uh, other uh, gastroenterologists from the country who have worked a lot on uh, ascites, especially uh, Professor uh, Virendra Singh from PGI Chandigarh. He has, uh, for last 20 years, been working constantly in, in this field and uh, contributed significantly to the uh, to the development of ascites. In the next uh, 40 minutes or so, I would like to uh, you know make this make the topic complex and then simplify. Uh, that's that's what I'm supposed to do so that you get better insights uh, on on management of ascites. I will try to keep my talk as practical as possible while giving you just a sound theoretical basis of why we are doing what we are doing because at times we tend to treat the pathophysiology of the patient rather than treating a particular diagnosis and i think this is uh, uh, very very true for ascites uh, as compared to any other disease we all know that uh, ascites is a common complication of uh, cirrhosis and the prerequisite for development of ascites because of cirrhosis is the interrelated pathophysiological processes which contribute to the development of ascites. One is endothelial dysfunction. In the snacknik circulation, this is excessive NO production which causes snacknik vasodilatation and severe sodium and water retention. And finally, sinusoidal portal hypertension. Now, how these are four uh, correlated with each, with each other uh, let's briefly see. Now, because of cirrhosis, we know that there's increase in the gut permeability. There's increased bacterial translocation, giving rise to PAMPs, liver injury, which gives rise to DAMPs, which will then activate the innate immunity, giving rise to systemic inflammation, production of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines and reactive oxygen species, which then will give rise to splenic arterial vasodilatation. The endothelial dysfunction directly also will contribute to the splenic arterial vasodilatation. Although there is an increase in the absolute cardiac output, this is still relative, uh, relatively lesser than what is required by the body because of the vasodilatation. And this gives rise to uh, redu reduced effective arterial blood volume. These two factors, splenic arterial vasodilatation giving rise to reduced effective arterial blood volume would then cause activation of the vasoconstrictors and the antinatriuretic systems. That is the RAS, SNS, and the vasopressin. This gives rise to sodium retention, which will then cause fluid retention and produce ascites. Excessive water retention, out of proportion to sodium retention, produces the dilutional hyponatremia, and severe vasoconstriction, which is initially a compensatory mechanism to maintain the renal glomerular perfusion when becomes excessive will give rise to the hepatorenal syndrome. We all know that uh, all, all these uh, are, are again simplifications, whereas in reality, most of these happen in different proportions in each patient. Ascites occurs in 50% of the patients over 15 years of development of cirrhosis. The mortality is approximately 40% at one year and 50% at two years after development of ascites. The most reliable factors in the prediction of poor prognosis are hyponatremia, low arterial pressures, increased serum creatinine, and low urinary sodium. So let's come to what, how do we actually assess a patient who comes to us with ascites. So of course we start with detailed history and this is for the postgraduates who are attending. Two things which point towards the etiology of uh, ascites being liver are reduction in the urine output. At times the patient realize it, at times the patient don't. But it is important that you elicit this, this history because this 
is a very important history to point towards the etiology being liver. The second is if you find history of associated dilated veins over the anterior abdominal wall, then that adds to the diagnosis. Of course, if you get history of uh, other features of liver disease, then that makes the diagnosis almost sure that you are dealing with liver disease related ascites. On examination, you want to quantify the amount of ascites as well as you want to see whether the patient has tense ascites or not. And you would want to see for other features of liver cell failure. Platelet count is a very important indicator of advanced liver disease. Of course, you would order for a liver biochemistry. You would always do investigations to rule out other systemic causes uh, of, uh, of ascites. Especially, you would want to rule out renal causes, uh, cardiac causes, especially when the history for liver disease is, is not there. The assessment of ascites itself starts with the ascitic fluid analysis. So that brings us to the big question of when do you do a diagnostic ascitic fluid analysis? So the standard advice of easel and ASL is for all new onset ascites. Now easel says grade two and three, ASL says all new onset ascites. So for me, all patients who have significant new onset ascites should be investigated. Yes, if you have a minimal interbowel fluid, it is non-tappable, you can ignore that ascites. All patients who have been hospitalized require a diagnostic uh, ascetic fluid tapping. Anybody who presents with a fresh complication of cirrhosis. So if a patient has GI bleed, hepatic encephalopathy, and has come to you with the, for the first time with, with these complications, then we must do uh, diagnostic ascetic fluid analysis. But there are other situations in addition to these standard advices where I would always recommend doing a diagnostic ascetic fluid analysis. In a patient who comes with oliguria, you would want to rule out spontaneous bacterial peritonitis and therefore even if the creatinine has not increased but the patient says that on the same dose of diuretics his output has not decreased, I would always look for ascetic fluid analysis. Whenever there is a loss of response to diuretics, so patients who were on a stable dose of diuretics for a lot of long period of time did not have ascites, and now suddenly on the same dose of diuretics, be, despite being salt compliant, now, now present with ascites or worsening of ascites, then it is important to rule out infections, and therefore you would do a ascetic fluid analysis. When I examine my patients and I put my hand on over the abdomen for palpation, if I find that the abdomen is warm disproportionately to the rest of the body, I would always do a cytotic fluid analysis. Anybody who presents with pain in abdomen or even an unexplained worsening of LFT in a cirrhotic patient uh, mandates a diagnostic acidic fluid analysis. Not only you would look for HCC or uh, portal vein thrombosis in these patients, but you would also do a cytotic fluid tapping to look for SBP. Next question comes, where should we tap the patient from? Now, this was a beautiful article in NEJM which discussed in depth the three sites which are commonly used, the left lower quadrant, uh, midline between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis, and the right lower quadrant. Now, the advantage is, uh, the conventionally preferred site was the midline, but the, the advantage which was for little chance of bleeding. The issues with this site is that there can be collaterals in the midline. If a bladder is hugely distended, you may inadvertently puncture the urinary bladder. And when you put in the needle, the needle is actually unstable. The left lower quadrant is the second site. Uh, the left lower quadrant is two to three centimeters kephalad and medial to the anterior superior allied spine. So roughly this is two finger breadths above and medial to the ASIS. The advantage of this site is that the maximum amount of fluid is uh, present in this area and it is pretty uh, thin. So it is easy to get fluid from this particular area. The disadvantage is in patients with uh, severe constipation and loaded colon, the, 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 
you may actually inadvertently puncture the colon. But this actually is the preferred site. The right lower quadrant, uh, which was used some time ago, is two to three centimeters kefalad and medial to the ASIS. The disadvantage is dilated cecum, appendicectomy, uh, adhesions, both of these can create problems, especially patients who are on lactulose, they can have trouble. There may be adhesions of the bowel, and this can also produce uh, inadvertent puncturing of the, of the bowel loops. What do we do with sweet duct? Collect the fluid. Please send the fluid in both plain bulb and the EDTA bulb. If you do not send the sample in EDTA bulb, the cell count will be unreliable. I've seen very often uh, samples being sent only in plain bulbs and then the cell count in, is inadvertently low and does not correlate. In patients with liver diseases, we would always do a bedside inoculation into a blood culture bottle. Always inoculate sufficient quantity of acidic fluid. Uh, most bottles will have a capacity of at least 15 ml. And that is the maximum that you can inject. So you please inoculate that into the blood culture bottle. The yield increases to 70 to 80 uh, as, 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 as per the usual technique of uh, sending blood cultures. What is mandatory to do every time in acidic fluid analysis is the cell count, both total as well as the differential, proteins, and the albumin levels. What you can opt for doing in different circumstances, as per the pretest probability, depending on the clinical scenario, you can ask for LDH and sugars if you're suspecting that there may be a secondary peritonitis. You can ask for a ADA, uh, which uh, Professor S.P. Mishra from Allahabad and Others have shown high sensitivity for tuberculosis. Uh, word of caution here, it is very useful to differentiate cirrhosis and tuberculous uh, peritonitis, but it is highly unreliable when you have mixed, uh, mixed ascites where both portal hypertension related ascites as well as tuberculosis is present. And we have had uh, some real life uh, challenges when interpreting ADA in these patients. So when you have such a scenario, it is always prudent to uh, look at either imaging evidence of uh, peritoneal tuberculosis or even better, the gold standard being a diagnostic laparoscopy to look at peritoneal tubercles. Malignant cells, uh, if there is an appropriate setting, then you would send for, uh, uh, for malignant cells, you send at least uh, 500 ml to a liter of fluid for this purpose, then it will be centrifuged and after the cytospin, then the cells are analyzed for uh, presence of uh, abnormal malignant cells. Amylase, if you're suspecting pancreatic ascites, pancreatic leaks, and then it becomes uh, very useful. A uh, level of more than 2000 would usually indicate presence of uh, pancreatic ascites. Acidic fluid triglycerides to assess for, for uh, chylus ascites, by and large, the triglyceride levels will be more than 200 in these patients. Very important question which is asked is, do you need to do correction of coagulopathy before tapping patients with cirrhosis? So beautiful article written by Professor Patrick Kamat et al. Wonderful uh, study done way back in 2004, which looked at tapping for uh, different groups of patients. So 84 patients had a INR of 2.5 and up above. Uh, another 208 patients had 2.1 to 2.5. Another 530 patients had 1.5 to 2. And similarly, platelet counts varied from 19,000 to, uh, to normal counts. And almost uh, 800 patients had a uh, platelet count uh, below 60,000. So that was a very, very interesting uh, patient cohort. None of them received any coagulopathy correction. Now, the most interesting part was oh, out of these 1,100 paracentesis which were done, where no coagulopathy correction was done, the tapping was done by well-trained endoscopy assistants. And there was uh, no other, uh, they, although they were being supervised by doctors, uh, they, they were done independently by endoscopy assistants. 612 paracentesis were done with the platelet count below 50,000. 
and there were no procedure related complications that required hospitalization. There was transient hyperpostural hypotension in three patients, leak which was self-limiting in one patient, and a traumatic tap which cleared spontaneously towards the end of the tapping in, five, in one patient. So total of five patients had just transient complications out of 1100, none of them having major bleeds, and uh, our experience is the, also the same. So they concluded paracentesis performed in an outpatient setting by our GI endoscopy assistants is safe and efficient, even in the presence of thrombocytopenia and prolongation of the prothrombin time. So routine corrections are not needed. So are there any patients where we have to be careful? The answer is a clear yes. Which are these patients where you have to be extra careful? Patients who have fibrinolysis or patients who are in uh, low-grade chronic DIC. So we will say that after doing blood collections, they tend to continue to bleed for a long time. Or you will find a lot of blue patches on their skin wherever the phlebotomy has been done. Or if they are admitted, then uh, at the point of central line, you will see a general ooze happening. So all these give you a hint that you may be dealing with a chronic DIC. And these are the patients where you have to be careful. And a test like uh, dynamic assessment of uh, clot formation like thromboelastography uh, is useful uh, in these patients before you tap. Presence of renal dysfunction uh, is another uh, feature where you have to be cautious because you can have qualitative platelet dysfunction and that can give rise to uh, increased risk of bleeding. If the INR is more than 2.5 and platelets are below 30,000, then you have to be cautious. And uh, I personally would do a TEG in these patients before I go ahead with tapping. In the presence of sepsis, again, because they have low-grade uh, uh, DIC or fibrinolysis, therefore, uh, you, you have to be extra careful. Very often, people ask me, USG-guided uh, tapping or uh, you know just percussion-based tapping, which is better? As long as you understand the anatomy of the inferior epigastric artery, I think uh, it, it is not much of a difference between uh, a blind tap versus USG guided tap. Our experience is that most of the times, even the, the small collaterals are missed on ultrasound. And uh, in fact, to be, fair, to be honest, we have seen uh, probably more complications of uh, major bleeds following USG guided tapping than clinically uh, doing the tapping because when they see an ultrasound, large pockets of fluid, sometimes complacency creeps in especially if you have an inexperienced person doing uh, uh, USG-guided uh, acidic fluid tapping. When you have the acidic fluid report, the first thing that you look for is the serum ascites albumin gradient. And this was a wonderful work done by Bruce Runyon and his group uh, in Annals of, published in Annals of Internal Medicine way back in 1992. Why I'm going back to, uh, to this paper, and I'll go back to a couple of uh, very old papers to understand the impact that they have had. Uh, on, on our think thought processes. And very importantly, where do we go wrong, wrong uh, because of overemphasis on these papers? So this was a pioneering work where uh, they looked at serum albumin minus acidic fluid albumin uh, and called it the SAG, serum acidic albumin gradient. And when they looked at patients with uh, cirrhosis, whether they were infected or sterile, the SAG ratio was, uh, the SAG was more than 1.1. And uh, if you looked at cardiac ascites, it was again more than 1.1. And uh, patients with other causes of portal hypertension also had 1.1. And if the patient had ascites because of a non-portal hypertension related cause, then they found that the SAG ratio was less than 1.1. Uh, if the patient had mixed ascites, the SAG remained more than 1.1. And this was their patient cohort. A quick thing to see, the number of patients with cirrhosis was 758 with or without infection. That's 84.1% of the cohort. And if you see the, the local causes were just 42. So based on this 42 patients data, we have till now uh, uh, based our clinical approach uh, towards understanding the etiology of patients with uh, ascites. So this is important for us to know because there are limitations of the SAG. The SAG can go wrong in patients with uh, ovarian tumors specifically. The SAG can go wrong 
in patients with uh, severe hypoproteinemia. If your serum albumin levels are very low, the SAG may be, may be low despite the patient having portal hypertension. And we are all aware of the, the cardiac cirrhosis where the SAG is usually high and myxedema ascites where the SAG is high. So when we talk of management of ascites, you are looking at the gradient, uh, the, the grading of ascites and certain terminologies like tense ascites, refractory ascites, decalcitrant ascites. So what does this mean? So grade one ascites is when it is detectable only on ultrasound or on radiology. Grade two is uh, moderate ascites. Grade three is severe ascites. Tense ascites is a term which was defined based on intraabdominal pressure, but for us uh, as clinicians, tense ascites means uh, whenever there is a resistance to palpation of uh, organs on percutaneous, uh, on per abdominal examination, uh, when you try to press your fingers in the ascites, that is called as tense ascites. Refractory ascites occurs in around 10% of cirrhotic patients. Once refractory ascites develops, the survival is around six months. And within one year, the mortality is almost 70%. Now the refractory ascites is further subdivided into two types. The diuretic resistant ascites, which is uh, ascites difficult to mobilize as defined by a failure to lose at least 1.5 kg per week of fluid weight, despite maximal diuretic therapy with spironolactone and furosemide or an equivalent dose of distal uh, acting and loop uh, acting diuretics. The second term is diuretic intractable ascites, which is difficult to mobilize because of the inability to provide effective doses of diuretics because of diuretic induced side effects like azotemia, hyponatremia, or other complications. When we come to now the management of ascites itself, the first step is salt restriction. And there's a huge controversy in this itself. Now, when we say salt restriction, what does it mean? The ACLD says sodium restriction to 88 millimoles per day because 78 is the obligatory renal loss and 10 millimoles is the obligatory non-renal loss of sodium from the body. So it is around two grams of salt uh, per day, two grams of sodium per day. So this is then, uh, if you go to the easel guidelines, they talk of moderate restriction of salt intake to 80 to 120 millimoles per day, which corresponds to 4.6 to 6.9 grams of salt per day. The easel guidelines say that it is equivalent to a no, no added salt diet. So if you are not taking up pre-prepared meals, that is ready-made meals from the market, if you're making your own food, then a moderate restriction of salt intake is just having the usual salt. Now, unfortunately, this is not true for our Indian population. An average Indian consumes 10.98 grams of salt per day. Now, even in this, there is regional variability and it has varied from 8 grams to 25 grams. So there are parts of Maharashtra where the average salt intake goes up to 25 grams per day. I'm sure there are other parts of the country where the salt intake is more. So for our patients, we cannot advise them to have no added salt, but just the usual salt. Here we have to actively advise them to restrict their salt intake to around five grams. An easy way to do that is, uh, is one small pinch of salt is around one grams. So you tell your patients to have around five pinches of salt in a day while ensuring that they don't have any food which has any salt in it. There are certain inherent, uh, there are certain foods which are inherently rich in salt in India, especially like your uh, uh, pickles and uh, papar and those sort of things. The one of the me mechanisms, one of the recommendations was if you can make the salt restriction even more severe and come down to two grams, one grams, or even no salt, you may actually get a better ascites control. But there is a trade-off. If you do a very strict salt restriction, the food actually becomes non-palatable, and this compromises on the nutrition, 
and the patients actually start becoming malnourished because they restrict their intake of food and this is a huge problem. So if you have an option of having a dry, frail patient versus a wet, robust patient, you would any day choose a wet, robust patient than a dry, frail patient. Water restriction is not routinely required. It should be done only in the presence of dilutional hyponatremia. So if the sodium levels fall below 125 or 120, you will advise water restriction. Otherwise, water restriction is not recommended at all. Now, I would want to tell you about some, some surreptitious salt intake uh, food items. We all are aware of pickles, rock salt, and black salt but also all the sauces, soy sauce, barbecue sauce, tomato sauce, have a lot of salt. Seafood, especially prawns and shrimps, are rich in salt. Packaged products like soups, hams, cheese, juices, fish, and poultry have a lot of salt. Baking products, because they have baking soda, are inherently rich in salt, like bread, sandwiches, pizzas, bagels, pastas, hummus, uh, your effervescent tablets are effervescent because they contain uh, uh, sodium bicarbonate and that is why uh, they have a large quantity of sodium and dried fruit powders. So uh, powders like amchur powder or imli powder, even if the package doesn't mention, once you taste, you realize that a lot of them will have a lot of salt intake, salt content. Next, we come to diuretics. So after salt restriction, almost all the patients you would need to give diuretics. The only patients where salt restriction would work is somebody with a grade one ascites. We know that aldosterone antagonists are more effective than loop diuretics and therefore are the diuretics of choice. And all the regimens have to be spironolactone based. However, the question comes whether you should give aldosterone alone, starting with 100 milligrams per day and going up to 400 milligrams, or you start off with a combination of aldosterone and furosemide or a loop diuretic. The disadvantage of aldosterone is that it takes almost 72 hours for its significant action to take place. And our patients are quite impatient and therefore uh, they are happier if you start them on a combination of spironolactone and furosemide, beginning with 100 milligrams of spironolactone and 40 milligrams of furosemide. It also helps because you get rapid natriuresis as well as the potassium levels are well maintained. In outpatient setting, with patients who have grade one or two ascites, you may start, think of starting only spironolactone, but be careful about potassium levels because they can tend to go higher. My experience is a lot of our patients, when they are diagnosed with any major disease, they start drinking a lot of fruit juices. Uh, most of our patients also have slightly lower hemoglobins and therefore they in almost inadvertently will start drinking uh, juices comprising of pomegranate juice or tomato juice, anything that is red, its juice will be uh, consumed, beetroot juice. So that pushes the potassium up and we have had life-threatening hyperkalemias very commonly because of this approach. So my personal choice for our patients is a combination of furosemide and spironolactone. The doses of both the oral diuretics can be increased simultaneously every three to five days, maintaining this ratio if the weight loss and natriuresis are inadequate. So how do we assess this response to diuretics? In an outpatient setting, you have to counsel the patient well most often, I would call the patients once a week for follow-up till I can get their ascites controlled. Ask them to report early if there are alarm symptoms. So if they get, if they feel very fatigued, if they are uh, having reduced urine output, if they have pain in abdomen, if uh, there's features of encephalopathy, then they should come immediately. We also ask them to maintain a blood pressure chart at home if possible. They have daily weight charting and report us if there's anything alarming there. Reduction of body weight of less than two kg per week uh, would, and with, uh, would lead to increase in the dose 
or adding a light loop diuretic if the patient is only on spironolactone. Once a week, we do creatinine and electrolytes for these patients. And every follow-up, we look for symptoms of fatigue, cramps, and hepatic encephalopathy, especially minimal hep covert hepatic encephalopathy because that tends to uh, creep in and go unnoticed. So unless you're looking actively for it, you may miss it, and then the patient will come with frank hepatic encephalopathy. You check the blood pressure, but please also remember to check orthostatic hypotension. A blood pressure drop of more than 20 would mean that the patient is significantly hypovolemic. The effective arterial blood volume is low, and this would entail that you need to reduce the diuretics and correct the volume status of the patient. In an inpatient setting, for grade 3 ascites, you would always start with a combination of a loop diuretic and a spironolactone. The maximum recommended weight loss during diuretic therapy is 0.5 kg in patients without edema and 1 kg in patients with edema. Although, if the patient has massive edema in the feet, a greater weight loss than 1 kg is pretty much acceptable. In an indoor setting, you review the dosing every 2 to 3 days. Do not change the dose every day. So, this is a word of caution when you are monitoring these patients. Every day, morning, evening, you check the blood pressure and look for orthostatic hypertension. And creatinine and electrolytes are done every alternate day. When do we reduce the dose of diuretics when the patient comes for follow-up? When the patient has had a complete response of edema feet, that is, the site is still there, but edema feet has disappeared, you decrease the dose of diuretics. The next time is when the patient has even disappearance of ascites, then you would again reduce the dose of diuretics further. If there is a loss of uh, weight of more than 1 kg in presence of edema feet and 0.5 kg without edema feet, then you would reduce the dose of diuretics to prevent complications. Patients who come to you with postural hypotension, patients with mild elevations of creatinine, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, you would want to decrease the dose of diuretics. And if you have uh, potassium levels less than 3.5 or more than 5.5. When will you stop the diuretics completely? Patients who have come with spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, patients with new onset hepatic encephalopathy, patients who have come to you with hypotension, blood pressure is less than 90, then you would stop the diuretics. If the creatine is increased by more than 0 0.5, 0 0.3 over the baseline, if despite being on diuretics, there is a sudden drop in urine output, this patient should not be subjected to increased dose of diuretics. In fact, you should stop diuretics till you know why the urine output has dropped suddenly. In patients who come with GI bleeds and patients with sodium levels below 120 or 125, depending on what school of thought you belong to. The other diuretics which we use uh, this was a wonderful study done by, uh, uh, by Paolo Angeli uh, almost uh, three and a half decades ago, which looked at uh, amyloride and compared it to aldosterone-like drug, which is potassium canrionate. And they found that amyloride was not as effective as spironolactone. Amyloride was very modestly effective, but it was effective in patients who had normal RAS levels. So if the RAS levels are normal, then amyloride is effective. So today, amyloride is used only for patients with spironolactone-induced gynecomastia. The other drug that we now have as an option to amyloride, which is probably more potent, is aplerinone, which is uh, known to reverse spironolactone-induced painful gynecomastia and cirrhotics. Uh, please remember that it takes around three months the equivalent doses of uh, eplerinone is uh, uh, 50 mg of eplerinone is equal to 100 mg of spironolactone. So you have to give half the dose. So it's double the potent, potency. Uh, if you look at the non-selective beta blockers, there is again a controversy in patients with uh, severe ascites, whether we should continue or we should not. But there are certain indications where we should discontinue non-selective beta blockers in presence of ascites. One is uh, when the patient has developed SBP, 
Second, if the patient has a decline in the systolic blood pressure to below 90 millimeters of mercury, if the patient has developed hyponatremia, less than 125 millimoles, in patients who have developed acute kidney injury, and if the patient has a pulse rate lower than 55 per minute, then we should stop the beta blockers. Why should we do though this? Because there is a risk of uh, increased uh, mortality in uh, patients with SBP or uh, patients who develop SBP while on being beta blockers. So this was a very elegant study, which was uh, done uh, some time back, which looked at the risk of uh, hypotension during the first paracentesis if the patient was on uh, beta blockers versus the patient who were not on beta blockers. And here, all the patients who were on non-sedative beta blockers did worse in terms of uh, the mean arterial pressure, the, the systolic pressure, the need for the first uh, paracentesis and the first SBP development, all were worse. So in patients with severe ascites with the history of SBP, uh, you have to be very careful with uh, beta blockers. So there was a difference in the transplant-free survival in, in those patients who had uh, SBP. So in patients who have SBP, uh, one must avoid uh, beta blockers. Of course, in HRS and AKI also, uh, we should be very, very careful while using beta blockers. And like I said, it's best avoided. The next question comes in patients with severe ascites, can we use IV furosemide? And I'll be talking about the safi safit regimen later on, but here we are just you talking about using IV furosemide to, to induce rapid uh, loss of fluid and uh, control of rapid control of ascites. So this was a very elegant study almost uh, three and a half decades ago because I've had uh, debates with the intensivists very often who tend to use IV furosemide very uh, easily for patients with, uh, with liver diseases. So this was a study which looked at the effect of uh, intravenous furosemide on renal clearances. Group two and three were the patients with cirrhosis without and with ascites. This was just a proof of concept study. So what you can clearly see is that there is a patient with, uh, with ascites showed a very rapid decline in the, in the, in the, in the glomerular function. And the uh, paraminohepirate clearance was actually much lower within the first 20 minutes and it kept on worsening for the first 60 minutes. Similarly, indolent clearance also dropped significantly in groups two and three, which are the cirrhotic patients. So the study concluded that IV furosemide in cirrhotic patients actually impairs renal clearances. This is how the GFR actually drops once the IV furosemide is given, and it does not come back to normal even after around four hours. In fact, it remains slightly on the lower side even after that. So you may actually paradoxically worsen the, the, the renal function in patients with, uh, the, with the, the use of IV furosemide. Look, Akas, can we take a break for the yeah. out here? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Akash. Uh, before we move on, we will take some questions. There is a flurry of questions coming. Let's take some questions for next five to six minutes, then move on. Uh, this first question is from Anand Gupta Jaipur. He says that easel guidelines recommend paracentesis for new onset grade two and ascite two and three ascites. Does this mean that new onset grade one ascites need not be tapped? Uh, I think we, we would always tap if the fluid is tappable. Uh, if uh, the only patients where you need not tap is you know, if it's a very small uh, interbowel fluid, uh, which, which is practically non-tappable. Some patients with grade one ascites, uh, you can ignore tapping, but I think for almost all patients who have significant ascites, you would do a tap. Okay. Next question is from Shivram Prasad Vishaka Patnam. He asks, in the pathogenesis of ascites, how much is the contribution of low serum albumin? Is there any threshold above which cirrhotic ascites is unlikely? So I think it does play a role, uh, but uh, uh, and, and, and definitely we know that uh, it reduces the plasma oncotic pressure, but it is not the main pathogenetic mechanism. Uh, the if you ask for a particular level, to me, whenever I have see a serum albumin level of uh, 3.5 or above, unsupported, this patient has not received albumin. 
I would definitely look for other causes of ascites before I attribute it to. Okay. And there are a lot of questions regarding ADA, utility of ADA. So one question is from Nikhilesh. ADA is not reliable. So is there a role of TB PCR? Another question: Is there any ADA cutoff for use in cirrhotic patients with tuberculosis? And another question on ADA: Can we lower the cutoff of ascitic fluid LBA ADA to help diagnosis of TB in cirrhosis? So I think we have had, uh, I think, quite a few studies on this uh, from uh, the major institutes. And uh, we found that it was uh, useful for uh, patients with uh, who had pure uh, tuberculous ascites and pure cirrhotic ascites. The problem is uh, very often we are dealing with patients with mixed ascites, and there the performance of ADA actually becomes unreliable. And uh, therefore, uh, uh, we look for alternative techniques. Unfortunately, uh, investigations like TB PCR have even lower sensitivity and uh, therefore uh, would almost never come positive. Uh, we have tried doing gene experts and they, they, that also is almost always uh, negative. So the only thing which helps whenever you are in a dilemma, whether you are dealing with TB or not, is either an imaging showing uh, uh, tuberculosis elsewhere, especially if you have pulmonary uh, lesions which are or sputum positivity, or if you see on the peritoneum uh, classical features of tuberculosis, or you do a diagnostic laparoscopy, and in that you do a peritoneal biopsy and you show that the patient has peritoneal tuberculosis. Uh, okay. While worrying about the cutoff of uh, ADA, I don't think there is robust data enough for us to suggest a cutoff value that below this you can safely rule out uh, TB. Yeah, there is one suggestion from Dr. Philip Abraham. He says that uh, one more indication for a cytic tap can be unexplained diarrhea in a cirrhotic patient with ascites. What yeah. do you say about I would I would agree with that completely. Yeah. That's again one of the features of SBP. Uh, one other question about scleroderma associated ascites with normal cardiac status and normal liver. Any idea? So uh, we have had one patient uh, who had uh, scleroderma related, who had scleroderma and he came with ascites. Uh, we have seen this in patients with MCTD also. So we don't know what, uh, what is the mechanism, whether it is because of the fibrosis in the peritoneum, because we did do a laparoscopy in this patient and we obtained biopsies also. Uh, unfortunately for us, uh, we, the bi peritoneal biopsy was normal. So we did liver biopsy, we did peritoneal biopsy, both came normal. So uh, these are my experience of two patients. And Dr. Manoj, you can add if you have. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. There are many more questions, but <laughs> I think I will take one more question. From Rajender Patel, uh, in the era of increasing medical legal cases, should all diagnostic typing be done under USG guidance? That is an I, important medical legal very, question. Very, very important question. Uh, I think uh, there is uh, enough data in literature to say that there is no increased risk of complication in patients who have significant ascites. You know, if you can percuss the ascites, you can safely do ascetic fluid tapping. When you can't percuss ascites, or it's a small quantity ascites, or clinically you can't get the shifting dullness, that means there is a possibility that it could be a calculated ascites. Or in imaging has shown that there is a loculated ascites, then it is better to go for uh, USG-guided tapping. But for routine significant ascites, which is percussible, you can demonstrate shifting dullness. I don't think uh, even medical legally uh, it is. Mm -hmm. There's some practice by a small uh, a, a proportion of people and not everybody. It is still acceptable. So this is an, an acceptable technique and therefore uh, According to Bolom's law. Rest of the questions at the end of the lecture. Maybe we can move on with your lecture, Dr. Akash. So next we come to uh, should we give uh, the albumin uh, intermittently? This was a beautiful study. Uh, multicentric uh, from uh, again uh, the Italian uh, investigators, the answer trial, which showed a significant improvement in the overall survival. This was the Kaplan Meier estimate. Uh, over 18 months, there was an improvement in survival. When they looked at uh, cumulative incidence of uh, death, uh, 
and tips all liver transplantation patients who were on the intermittent human albumin group did better in terms of both survival as well as need for tips or transplant this was across the child pug score and uh, even there was improvement in the male score uh, for these patients this was on the basis of competing risk model and uh, they looked at uh, the need for first paracentesis that was also lower in patients who were on albumin and uh, the risk of uh, development of refractory ascites was also significantly lower. So the hazard ratios were 0.48 and 0.43 if the patients were on weekly albumin therapy and this was competing risk analysis. So that is what makes it even more uh, robust data, not just kaplan meier When they looked at uh, the complications, uh, the risk of SVP, the non-SVP bacterial infection was lower. The risk of development of hepatic encephalopathy, renal dysfunction, hyponatremia, HRS, hyperkalemia were all lower when patients were treated with uh, albumin therapy. Of course, the portal hypertension uh, related complications were similar in the two groups, and that is what you can expect. So coming to uh, the next part of the talk, uh, management of refractory ascites. Now, if you have exhausted your diuretics, uh, which is what the definition says, that if you have given the maximum dose of diuretics, 400 milligrams of spironolactone or one, and 160 milligrams of pyrazomide, or patient develops complications because uh, of the diuretics, then you call it refractory ascites. But before you label somebody as refractory ascites, please go through this checklist. And this is the most important step. This is where very often you'll find a reason for the refractory ascites. And if you correct the, this reason, you will correct the refractoriness of the ascites. So the first thing is to look for salt compliance. You look at the history of the patient. Very often ask the family members, uh, if, you, if, if they're daughters, wives, please ask them, you look at the urine spot sodium to potassium ratio. Now we have given up on doing uh, urinary spot sodium, but if you look at urine spot sodium to potassium and somebody has a weight gain despite having a high sodium to potassium ratio, then you know that the compliance is a problem. Look at the dose of diuretics, uh, whether the appropriate dose of diuretics is going on, whether the patient has been taking what we have prescribed or not. Third is look for hypovolemia, look for postural drop, IVC, skin turgor. Very often you have not asked the patient to restrict their water intake, but somebody in the family or some other doctor or family physician has advised them not to drink uh, water. And in the summers, he is still drinking one liter of water. And, and that is what is causing hypovolemia, AKI, and that is what is uh, leading to refractiveness of the ascites. Rule out vascular issues, so uh, always do a Doppler uh, and, and if required, uh, if the creatinine permits, then do a cross-sectional imaging to rule out portal vein thrombosis, hepatic vein thrombosis, or even portal arteriovascular fistulae. Take a history for drugs like NSAIDs. Uh, very often patients don't even count NSAIDs as drugs. Also look for history of uh, methotrexate, amiodarone, Ask them if they're taking alcohol. Very often they're taking small quantities of alcohol and that is what makes the ascites refractory. I would always do a 2D echo to rule out a cardiac disorder, especially either uh, a primary cardiac disease in alcoholics dilated cardiomyopathy or patients with severe uh, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which may be contributing to the ascites formation and making the ascites refractory. Beta blockers need to be stopped uh, once the patient has developed diuretic refractory ascites, and uh, I would always do that to see if the cardiac function improves, the cardiac output improves, and we actually have better renal perfusion and the patient actually starts uh, losing the, uh, the fluid. And I would always rule out infections, uh, tuberculosis infections, SBP, or infection elsewhere in the body before we label somebody as refractory ascites. So, uh, Acidic fluid tapping at this stage is mandatory to ensure that we are missing, not missing out on a peritoneal infection. The first step is often uh, large volume paracentesis. It is the most common treatment for refractory ascites and is defined as aspiration of more than five liters of ascites. It does immediately relieve ascites and tenseness, but the ascites will almost always uh, recur and does not improve the survival. It only makes the patient comfortable. 
So the indication today is uh, if the patient has having respiratory embarrassment or the patient is unable to carry out uh, his activities because of the ascites, that is when you would advise uh, large volume paracentesis for immediate relief. The risk is development of paracentesis induced circulatory dysfunction. Uh, and, and I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. The other thing is when, even when we are doing LVPs, we must continue the diuretics if the patient is tolerating them. Unless there are major complications or the urinary sodium level is less than 30 millimoles per day. So this is one of the situations where urinary sodium level is still having a role. So what does LVP do? Uh, LVP basically uh, increases the synthesis of uh, NO. This reduces the systemic vascular resistance, decreases the mean arterial pressure, which is also reduced because of the reduced intraabdominal pressure causing hypovolemia. This reduces the cardiac index, pulmonary pressures, and gives rise to activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone axis. Uh, it does stimulate the cardiac volume receptors because of the sudden volume loss, uh, stimulates the atrial natriuretic peptide, thereby causing the increased vasodilatation, contributing further to hypovolemia. So all these together contribute to the development of PICD. So Perigenes uh, is the, my teacher and under whom I trained. Uh, did this excellent study way back in 1988 to see whether uh, giving intravenous albumin after paracentesis uh, helped or not. And what they showed was that in patients in group one, which is the one which received the albumin therapy, uh, there was a, a no drop in the BUN and the sodium levels, unlike the control arm, as well as the, the plasma, RNA uh, plasma RNA activity and the plasma aldosterone concentration did not differ five days after the tapping uh, in those who got albumin as compared to those who did not. When they looked at the other complications, overall complications were similar in the two groups, but uh, there was no hyponatremia or renal impairment uh, in, in patients with, uh, who received albumin. Only one patient developed hyponatremia as compared to nine and six patients in those who did not get uh, albumin. Now, this was a meta-analysis of uh, multiple trials. And as compared to all other volume expanders, albumin did much better with a hazard ratio of 0.34, odds ratio of 0.34. So uh, with a 95% CI of 0.23 to 0.51. So very, very strong evidence in favor of albumin. Uh, the evidence of albumin as compared to vasoconstrictors is, is less weak, is more weak. Uh, the the meta-analysis did not show a huge difference, although there was a tendency towards favoring albumin, but it did not reach statistical significance and the two were found to be comparable. Similarly, uh, mortality uh, was uh, significantly different if you used other volume expanders as compared to uh, albumin. So you must use albumin. It saves lives after doing a large volume paracentesis. Uh, with vasoconstrictors, again, the mortality rate was similar, although there was a tendency towards favoring albumin. So to prevent uh, this uh, PICD, albumin is given uh, in the dose of eight grams per liter of fluid removed. The most important thing in this is this has to be done after the tapping is over. So start the albumin infusion after the tapping is done. Uh, if you don't want to go into the calculations, the simple way to remember is one bottle of albumin for every two and a half liters of fluid that is tapped. That is 20% of 100 ml albumin. Another uh, practice uh, pearls I can give you is do not give the diuretics on the day of tapping and the next day, and do not give beta blockers on the day of tapping. Avoid tapping more than five to six liters if you can, uh, uh, unless uh, the patient has such a massive ascites that it is mandatory five to six liters. It does not uh, help the respiratory embarrassment, then you can tap more, but avoid tapping more than five to six liters. Midodrine was found to be effectively effective in one study and 
that may be an alternative in case you are not able to get albumin, which is what happened to some of my patients uh, during this lockdown. They could not get albumin and therefore I had to use midotrine for some of my patients. Uh, TIPS is actually superior to large volume paracentesis for long-term control of ascites. And the guidelines say that if the patient has required four or more paracentesis procedures, then TIPS is recommended. The advantage of TIPS is it decompresses the hepatic sinusoids as well. So not only reduces the, improves the circulation, but also decompresses the sinusoids. And therefore, it uh, relieves the refractory ascites by directly reducing portal venous pressure. Uh, we know that it may improve survival, but it does not reverse the pathological process of the liver cirrhosis. And therefore, anybody who needs a TIPS also needs a liver transplantation. So once a patient has reached the stage of refractory ascites, he needs a transplant as soon as possible. So what are the indications and contraindications of TIPS for refractory ascites? Patients who have uh, received four or more paracentesis procedures or if the patient can't tolerate paracentesis or it is contraindicated, then TIPS is recommended. The contraindications are uh, patients with severe liver cell failure, childbirth uh, C13 uh, or above, meld of more than 20, patients with uh, cardiac failure, in particular right-sided cardiac failure, patients with uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, Moderate to severe pulmonary hypertension uh, would entail uh, contraindication to doing TIPS. Similarly, for uh, cardiac failure, yes, or even mild to moderate, moderate uh, right-sided cardiac failure would mean that you cannot go ahead with TIPS. This does not mean that left-sided cardiac failure you can go ahead. That is an obvious uh, contraindication. Patients with uh, anatomical or technical contraindications, uh, unrelieved biliary obstruction, and extensive hepatic malignancy is a contraindication for doing a TIPS. What does TIPS do? Why, why we are talking about TIPS so much? It does improve the urinary sodium excretion, and uh, these are the different studies, and as the time progresses, the urinary excretion actually keeps on increasing, and the serum creatinine actually keeps on decreasing over a period of uh, four to six months after doing a TIPS. That is because of the improved hemodynamics as well as uh, because the plasma renin activity will keep on decreasing, the aldosterone levels fall down, and the noradrenal levels also decrease after doing a TIPS. The cardiac output uh, actually increases. The peripheral resistance decreases after doing a TIPS. And that is why you'll see uh, patients uh, developing mild edema uh, feet after uh, doing TIPS. Uh, not an unusual thing. Their ascites disappears, but some of them will develop peripheral edema, uh, which you can notice on day two, day three, and then that persists for, uh, for almost a month or so, uh, and then, then disappears because the peripheral, uh, the systemic uh, peripheral resistance uh, is, comes back to its baseline level. Now, what is the effect of TIPS on nutrition? It, it is associated with the uh, improvement in the body cell mass, in the muscle cell mass, and uh, Reduce, uh, increase in the caloric intake as well as the resting energy expenditure. So improved nutritional status is an important finding. Recent studies have also shown that it is associated with the uh, increase in the sarcopenia as well as the performance status. Does it give survival benefit? The, answer, the initial studies were mixed with some studies showing a survival benefit and some not. But now we know for sure that most patients uh, actually have a chance of improved survival uh, with TIPS as compared to uh, with just uh, large volume for paracentesis. So there is some uh, survival benefit with TIPS. One of the concerns which people have is if you have done a TIPS, then doing transplant is, is difficult. Uh, this was a very elegant study done, published in Hepatology in 2016 uh, from, the, uh, from the US database. And uh, which looked at over 7,000 patients who had undergone TIPS, and they showed that the risk of death or transplantation was uh, lower for patients who have undergone a TIPS. So their survival was better, and even uh, they had a better chance of undergoing a transplantation over a period of time. So their survival till transplantation was better. Uh, 
so less people died and uh, and a greater proportion of patients survived till transplantation so the weightless mortality was lower in patients who had undergone tips and patients could be successfully transplanted so uh, you need not worry about the tips for transplant as long as the tips is appropriately placed the problem is if the tips stent is uh, projecting way up into the right atrium or projecting way down into into the extra hepatic part of the portal vein then you will struggle at the time of transplantation so the appropriate length and the right placement of the tips stent is of paramount importance uh, coming to the last part of my talks and that is vasoconstrictive drugs uh, midodrine and clonidine are uh, the two vasoconstrictive drugs midodrine is used in uh, patients with cirrhosis and ascites it increases the effective arterial blood volume by causing splanchnic vasoconstriction improving renal perfusion and the glomerular filtration and therefore the ASLD guidelines recommend midodrine for refractory ascites uh, the other drug is clonidine, which is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist with effects that are similar to midodrine. So it increases the, uh, causes vasoconstriction. But uh, the advantage of clonidine is that it causes, it, it reduces the blood pressure. So in most of the patients, it is not useful. But it is the only drug which you can use in that subgroup of patients who come to you with very high sympathetic nervous system activity and therefore have tachycardia and hypertension. So very small subgroup of patients, especially young patients, young cirrhotics uh, in their 30s and 40s, it is not unusual to find having, uh, some of them having a blood pressure of 160, 170, 180 systolic, and they, that is where you struggle to control their ascites. Their renal function is very brittle, and there you can use uh, clonidine uh, effectively. Midodrine, of course, uh, helps because it increases the blood pressure. Now, use of midodrine in refractory ascites uh, was uh, shown uh, in several studies, uh, including uh, by Professor Virendra Singh from PGI Chandigarh. We know that it improves the weight as compared to standard medical therapy because of reduction in the ascitic fluid. It increases the mean arterial pressure because of splanchnic vasoconstriction and increases the urinary volume because of the improved renal perfusion. So this is, uh, was shown uh, in several studies. In another study, they demonstrated that the sodium excretion in the urine improved, the plasma renin activity reduced, and the plasma aldosterone levels also fell down uh, at one month after using midodrine. So we know it inhibits the renin angiotensin and aldosterone axis. It will cause peripheral vasoconstriction, improves renal perfusion. Uh, the thing is, it it does not always translate equally into the benefit in clinical practice. Can't expect magical outcomes. So yes, we know that the response rates improve uh, in uh, uh, complete response is far more common in patients with the midodrine in refractory ascites as compared to standard medical therapy. Partial response is pretty common. So this was a study which looked at uh, three months and six months. So at three months, partial response was present in 10 patients as compared to seven patients in the standard medical therapy group. But more importantly, uh, uh, there was no response in one, only one patient of midodrine and eight patients of medical therapy. So uh, you can expect some partial improvement at least in a majority of patients and complete improvement in almost uh, a third of the patients who are treated with midodrine. The key thing is dosing of midodrine. The starting dose is five milligrams orally three times a day, and you adjust the dose uh, frequently to achieve an increase in the systolic blood pressure of approximately 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury, or more likely uh, after a very elegant study, we know that if you have achieved a target mean arterial pressure of 82, then it is associated with much better control of ascites and less uh, renal dysfunction. Uh, midodrine should be taken during the daytime only to prevent risk of supine hypertension and there should be a gap of at least six hours between the two doses. Uh, the drug interactions of midodrine have to be remembered. Uh, you cannot combine it with digoxin. You cannot combine it with other drugs which increase blood pressure like phenylephrine, ephedrine, thyroid hormones, ergot derivatives or salt retaining steroids like fludopartisone. You can't give it with mau inhibitors. Uh, 
if you give it with alpha blockers, then uh, you can antagonize the effects. So patients with prostatic enlargement, you have to be very, very careful because midodrine can cause urinary retention. And therefore, uh, do not use midodrine in these patients. Interaction with metformin, renitidine, and other antiarrhythmic drugs is also there. So we have to be cautious about using. Then we come to weptans, which are V2 receptor antagonists. They are very, very uh, you know, tempting to use because of the equiresis, that is loss of just water without loss of sodium. And therefore, you, we are all tempted to use it in patients with dilutional hyponatremia because you can treat hyponatremia as well as reduce the fluid overload because these are the patients where you cannot right now use diuretics. The only thing that you can do is restrict their fluid intake and wait for the sodium to correct. Very often it takes a long time for the sodium to correct in these patients. So the initial reports were promising, but then a negative phase three study with cetaveptan was a major setback. And then of course the black box warning, uh, which came, uh, which, which sort of uh, nailed the uh, coffin uh, of, of for weptans. So the risks in, uh, and the cost did not entail uh, the routine use of uh, weptans. In fact, the guidelines in, uh, mentioned that uh, there is no evidence that uh, we should use them. The risk is too high in 2012. But there is a renewed interest in these uh, weptans because of our better understanding and the right indications. And these are the three studies which showed that uh, there may actually be a role for tolweptan in patients with the refractory ascites. So the first was a Japanese study in J gastroenterology where they looked at the, uh, the subgroup analysis of patients who benefited uh, with tolweptan and these are the patients with severe hyponatremia. So edema with severe hyponatremia. Uh, then the second study showed that in patients with normal renal function only, there is a benefit and, uh, uh, but even those patients who have impaired renal function may also have get some benefit uh, with the use of tolweptan. So this was a study published in BMC Gastroenterology in 2018 which showed that uh, overall patients who received tolweptan, they actually benefited uh, in terms of survival. And when they looked at the subgroups, it was patients who responded to tolweptan where the sodium levels normalized. They are the patients who had a high chances of survival as compared to those patients where despite taking tolweptan, the sodium levels did not improve. Uh, in those patients where hyponatremia improved with a placebo, their survival was still poorer. So this tells us that it was tolweptan which made the patient survive longer and not just the correction of hyponatremia. But they come with a black box warning. So there is a risk of increased GI bleeding in patients with liver diseases. Uh, the other wise safety profile is good. We have seen some patients developing very large quantity of urine after giving small doses. So we actually start with a much lower dose of tolweptan, uh, sometimes half a tablet or even one fourth tablet. Uh, but again, remember that this is off-label prescription. This is not uh, something which should be done routinely. The recommendation is that tolweptan or weptans should be used only as an inpatient under supervision after explaining the risk to the patient uh, of GI bleeding. In patients with child C cirrhosis, it is best avoided. It has also been shown to be associated with uh, intracranial bleeds as well. The sodium levels should be monitored very closely because uh, if you are not careful, the sodium levels can go up dramatically and that can cause osmotic demyelination. What about combining the two, midodrine and tolweptan? This was an elegant study done by, again, uh, Professor Virendra Singh, and he showed that the combination of, uh, of uh, tolweptan plus midodrine plus standard medical therapy led to more complete responses as compared to either tolweptan or midodrine. We have a new device called as alpha pump system. Uh, this is a new technology that was introduced uh, only around three, four years ago. It is a subcutaneously implanted uh, battery powered patient, which takes the ascites from the peritoneal cavity and puts it into the urinary bladder. Uh, it is useful for patients who are unsuitable for TIPS or who have failed TIPS 
or patients with uh, portal vein thrombosis, which is not amenable to TIPS, or patients with severe cardiac dysfunction associated. So where uh, nothing else works, and the moment you give diuretics, the creatinine starts going up. So those are the patients who do well with, uh, with such uh, alpha pump placement. It, reducts, it reduces the need for uh, LVP, but it is a potential source of infection. Availability in India is still an issue, and uh, cost is prohibitive. It costs almost up to 20 lakh of rupees, if you want to put it. So I have had only one patient who actually had it inserted in France and then came to us for, uh, for because he shipped it to Mumbai. Uh, Plurex may be an alternative, uh, but again, this is just uh, case reports which we have, and we don't have any proper study. Akash, now, Steph, Dr. Yes, Akash, we'll have to bind up. Yeah, the, there's the last last two slides. So, uh, Safi Safit, uh, Dr. Professor Vivek Saraswat is the one who, uh, along with Gaurav uh, Pandey, had uh, talked about uh, Safi and Safit. Uh, which is continuous infusion of uh, furosemide albumin with monitoring of urinary sodium, uh, along with uh, with uh, with hemodynamic monitoring and potassium monitoring, and adding terlipressin if the urinary sodium remains low. And they have shown uh, excellent results uh, with this uh, CFAT. This is how they monitor. Of course, there are stopping rules. Uh, we need uh, validation from uh, other centers. Liver transplantation is the treatment of choice for patients with refractory ascites. And uh, this is uh, associated with uh, radical reversal of portal hypertension and excellent survival after the transplantation. So the coming to the final steps uh, to summarize, we start with salt restriction as the first step for control of ascites. Then we initiate diuretics. We monitor the weight creatinine, electrolytes, look for clinical features like postural hypotension. Increase the dose of diuretics if the above parameters are good. But at this stage, when the increased uh, requirement of diuretics is there, counsel the patients about the need for transplant in the near future. If the patient still develops ascites further, consider adding regular albumin infusions. Despite this, if the ascites progresses, checklist for all the causes of refractory ascites and correct whatever we can, especially recheck the salt compliance. This is the time to consider doing a liver transplant because we are now labeling this patient as refractory ascites. The options that you have is LVP with adequate albumin replacement. If it is done repeatedly, then it is better to do TIPS if there are no contraindication to doing TIPS. If TIPS is contraindicated or patient is unwilling, then add midodrin, especially if the mean arterial pressure is low or the patient has a brittle renal function and is sensitive to the diuretics. If the patient has hypovolemic hyponatremia and is not a child plug C, that is his child plug A or B, you can give toleptan with due risk as an acute measure get ascites and sodium under control under close supervision. Repeated taps is the last resort if nothing else works. In such patients, you can explore alpha pump or other research protocols. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Uh, you have some questions asked. Ask yeah, I can ask a question. Okay. One question you can ask. Which of the following statements is true? Non-selective beta blockers need to be stopped if patient develops new onset ascites, TIPS is safe in patients with moderate pulmonary hypertension. Rock salt can be consumed in cirrhotic ascites. And option four, tolveptan has a high risk of IC bleed in advanced cirrhosis. Right. I think while we wait for the audience, please keep the question on your screen, Akash. Uh, yeah. Maybe we can have uh, we can start with some of the questions that have poured in for your talk. I think we'll probably because of time constraints stick with just this one question and uh, skip the other two that you might have got ready, Akash. So, uh, so I think I must compliment you on a very detailed and a very informative talk on ascites. Uh, it's a huge topic, and there are a lot of practical 
this step by step uh, approach i am sure people have come to learn a lot but i think because we what i'll do is in the next about 7 8 minutes uh, put some of the questions that have come in uh, from the audience and i think whenever you are ready with the answer um, govin please do step in so the uh, i think the first set of questions i'll start with the early part of your talk akash what to do with the procedure of acyclic tap how would you consider tapping or tapping or sampling a patient who is on chronic ambulatory peritoneal dialysis because they always have an indwelling catheter and how do you diagnose uh, uh, sbp in this situation so i think uh, patients who have a indwelling catheter you don't really need to tap uh, what we usually will do is uh, we would uh, if you are suspecting an infection we would culture them because uh, some amount of elevation of uh, wbcs is common in patients who have a peritoneal catheter so if the uh, wbc count is in thousands or if the culture is positive then we know that there is infection i would not use the word sbp in patients who are on peritoneal dialysis because uh, it will be virtually impossible to say whether it is uh, primary or uh, secondary because you have a known source of infection in these patients so you just call it peritoneal fluid infection if yes, you pick sir. up uh, and the the criteria for that would be the same as 250 polymorphs or uh... no it's it's usually uh, when it is more than 1000 that is when we usually will say uh, but it's it's yeah, culture has to be positive right uh, i think we spoke a bit about mixed ascites and that's quite common so what are the precise diagnostic criteria you would use to label a patient as having this is dr ankit from mumbai who wants to know so i think uh, one of the uh, if the patient has both portal hypertension related ascites and tuberculosis uh, you have to uh, have a high sag ascites that is for sure in addition uh, you need to demonstrate tuberculosis in some form so either a ada value which is very high or a radiological feature which is consistent with tuberculosis or a sputum uh, or or extra peritoneal tuberculosis proof in the form of sputum afp uh, or a diagnostic laparoscopy showing uh, a peritoneal biopsy caseating granulomas or tuberculosis so i think so we need one of these to be sure that we are dealing with a combination of portal hypertension ascites and tuberculosis right so and in the same continuation dr dr from chennai has i think probably this question has come up earlier that what should be the cut off of ada for diagnosing tuberculosis in cirrhotic ascites given the low protein values and in fact professor philip abraham has suggested that maybe 25 or lower maybe rather than the usual 37 or 40 uh, would be could be the cut off in uh, cirrhosis so what are your comments on that so i think it uh, we don't have a systemic systematic study to uh, or, or robust enough data to have a definite cut off value although different there are studies which have proposed lowering the criteria but uh, it will also depend on the state of cirrhosis stage of cirrhosis somebody has a protein uh, acidic fluid proteins of 0.03 or 0.1 uh, you know the, these patients uh, are, are very dilute uh, ascites their ad levels are really really low i have seen uh, patients with tuberculosis with ad values in single digits also so i won't commit to a particular level as mm. the cut off you have to use your clinical discretion in these patients and uh, you have but you have to have a high index of suspicion that's that's the key thing and mm. uh, very often i have seen uh, patients with uh, these uh, patients with peritoneal tuberculosis also have involvement of the liver uh, very often and you'll find uh, elevated ggt unexplained in these patients and that is an indirect uh, indicator that is, yeah, that is the uh, concomitant other collateral evidence regarding the fluid yes. ad value you are not uh, comfortable with simply lowering it to a certain with level with giving a absolute lower cut off value uh, i i okay okay uh, any answers govind are you uh, we waiting yeah, for govind makaria can answer because i know he has uh, done a lot of work on this no. so so we we have answer to the question which uh, uh, the poll for audience say 87% people say tolvaptin has a high risk of ic bleeding uh, 30% uh, non selective beta blockers should be need not be need to be stopped and likewise so any comment on that ac so i think i think most of them have got it correctly that tolvaptin has a high risk of bleeding they were listening to the talk because this was not in the slides i had only spoken this uh, sentence so thank you audience and i think amazing uh, they have they have really really uh, no, made have, my day 
we have so had perfect. a very good audience participation today. So, uh, you, can you stop sharing your screen, Akka, so we go to the yeah, yeah. uh, real panel. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I think uh, maybe another five minutes of questions. Uh, go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, right. So, um, uh, Dr. Anand from Chennai wanted to know from you, Akash, about the differentiation between hemorrhagic ascites and a traumatic tap. And uh, what exactly in a cirrhotic patient uh, significance do you attach to hemorrhagic ascites? All very simple and practical questions, but it would be nice to hear your view on this. Yeah, I know. So, this is a very, uh, very, very practical question. So, traumatic ascites uh, usually will, uh, with the blood clots, when you keep it. Uh, and, and it is because of the needle trauma that there is bleeding. And because this is fresh blood, therefore it, it clots. Uh, hemorrhagic ascites, on the other hand, is uh, already had a bleeding and has lysed. And now you are seeing the, the RBC. So that, uh, that does not clot again. So that is how you differentiate. So you just keep the, the sample uh, for, for five, seven minutes in front of you and you see whether the clot forms or not. The importance of hemorrhagic ascites is, is, is that you should immediately suspect whether you're dealing with a malignancy. And, and to me, uh, so malignancy or a, or, or a pancreatitis, uh, necrotizing pancreatitis along with it. So these are the two conditions which I would immediately think of in patients with uh, hemorrhagic ascites. Right. A word of caution here, those who have had previously traumatic uh, uh, ascites, uh, you know, tapping, in them, when you tap next time, you may actually get hemorrhagic ascites. So don't get uh, flamox. Some time for that to clear up. So within a few days apart, you might find that it appears. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Shrikant from Delhi wants to know what is the method for therapeutic tapping uh, when you do large volumes? Most often you see people sticking a needle in the abdomen and uh, drain it with a IV uh, set or should a pigtail catheter and a sealed system be used? So I think there is one paper which is recently published with the pigtail, but I think uh, most of us who are happy with the uh, uh, with needle set uh, we would uh, put in a 21 gauge uh, needle, uh, put it in the left lower quadrant and uh, place it uh, in such a way that the traction is still maintained, the pressure is still maintained. I think the key here is the way you fix it. Very often uh, when uh, you know, you're at the beginning of your career, you're tapping, you only drain two, three liters and the fluid stops after that because the needle has popped out. So it's the way you fix the needle to the abdomen which determines. So that has to be done in a way that traction is maintained even when the fluid is decreasing. Uh, right. Uh, a few questions regarding the SAG value, the serum ascites albumin gradient. Uh, Dr. Neha from Gurgaon is asking, then how, uh, what is the serum albumin level below which you would uh, regard this as unreliable? There may be severe levels of hypoalbuminemia and uh, you actually have a high SAG, but the number is below 1.1. So in the original study, the lowest albumin value, serum albumin value was 1.8. So, uh, and, and most of the other subsequent studies have also had albumin levels of more than, uh, of, of two or above. So to me, uh, a value of less than uh, 1.8 is something where I'm extremely cautious about interpreting SAG values. Once serum albumin is below 1.8, you have to be cautious and then use probably your clinical uh, sense rather than simply the number. Uh, uh, right. Similarly, I think Dr. Jayanti from Chennai wants to know what is the utility and what should be the SAG values in patients with myxedema ascites, nephrogenic ascites. Does 1.1 still hold true in these situations? So absolutely, madam. So uh, both, both these conditions that she mentioned, the SAG value is actually more than 1.1. And that is what the limitation of SAG. Okay, right. So <laughs> people are listening to your talk and noting all the points. So, uh, and how reliable is SAG in a patient with mixed ascites when you have a, a high SAG because of portal hypertension, but high protein because of tuberculosis? So I think uh, we have had uh, this situation rarely where uh, uh, we had a mixed uh, ascites and the SAG was low. I, I can count these patients on my fingers. So I think uh, in mixed ascites, almost always the SAG will be more than 1.1. In fact, if you get a SAG of less than 1.1, you will really question how much is the contribution of portal hypertension to this ascites. Right. Okay. Now, I think uh, you mentioned regarding uh, TEG your before tapping in people with cirrhosis and uh, coagulopathy. So there are a few questions 
uh, about uh, this. Uh, Dr. Pradeep uh, Nagarwal from Dehradun wants to know that should tech be routinely used in patients with a coagulopathy? And Dr. Anand from Mumbai is asking, how do you interpret tech before tapping? If you get a tech value, and what do you do with it? So uh, I don't do tech for every patient. I think tech should be reserved for those patients where there is a clinical suspicion of uh, either chronic DIC or fibrinolysis or the patient is septic and with uh, grossly deranged coagulation parameters. So in those patients only I would do. And again, I, what I'm worried about is uh, the, the, the mean amplitude and uh, the, the LY30. So if I see accelerated fibrinolysis or I see just a flat curve, what we call as a champagne glass. If you see those sort of curves, then you're worried. If there are a lot of endogenous heparinoids, then uh, you'll be worried because when, when you get a flat line. So those are the situations when you're worried. I'm not so worried about the angle or the, uh, or, or the other parameters. Okay. And uh, Dr. Akash from Chandigarh wants to know whether measuring D-dimers in the blood would be as useful as TEG to identify hyperfibrinolysis. That is your concern. So I am not aware of a study where they have uh, correlated D-dimer with, uh, with uh, acidic fluid tapping. Uh, so at this stage, I, it, even if I do, I don't know how I to interpret that data. But that is something which I think should be explored. Okay. Right. And uh, does uh, Dr. Karthik Nara in Chennai, his question is, uh, how do you use the tech tracing to decide uh, what kind of plasma or component uh, you should give before you do a tap? Okay. So again, so you look at the platelet component and so what again I'm interested more is the platelets. So if I have a very prolonged R time or the MA is, is really uh, small, that is when I'm looking for uh, using uh, platelets. If I have accelerated thrombolysis, then I would give uh, something like tranexaminic acid and uh, allow the tech to, to become normal and then only go ahead and do the tapping for these patients. Uh, uh, right. I think uh, I'll take a few more minutes to there are three a few questions on diuretics. You've basically given two or three talks in one, Akash. So standard diuretic management of ascites, serotic ascites, then refractory ascites. I don't think we'll have enough time to cover ground for all of those. About 135 odd questions have come in. So the rest will find their way to your inbox for uh, your reply and putting on the site. So I'll just cover the bit on diuretics now. Uh, Dr. Bhavik Shah from Calcutta and Dr. Arun Singh from Indore uh, wanted to know about dose of diuretics that you've used. For refractory ascites, the 400 plus 160, have you, how often or if ever have you used such a high dose of diuretics? Because most people don't tolerate, serotics don't tolerate much above 100 milligrams pyranolactone on 40 milligrams furosemide for any length of time. So uh, I, I agree that a large proportion of patients will not tolerate uh, these doses. And I think uh, maybe less than, I, I can't give you a figure, but I think uh, less than a quarter of the patients or maybe even lesser than that would actually go on to receive these doses. So I can again remember the patients, probably once a year I see a patient where I go to these doses, not more than that. By and large, I think we often have um, uh, side effects kicking in before you can reach yeah. these levels. Uh, Dr. Rakesh from Lucknow wants to know your thoughts about starting diuretics in ascites in a patient with CKD and but also the use of diuretics when SBP has been diagnosed, stopping diuretics and thereafter mobilizing people. How do you proceed? I think the excellent question. So uh, in patients with CKD, uh, the loop diuretics uh, are actually the ones which are uh, preferred because of the risk of hyperkalemia. So uh, unless the patient has uh, a CKD, which is like a salt wasting nephropathy, in which case you anyways won't see a, uh, ascites at all because there is no sodium retention. So uh, by and large, uh, you are okay to start off uh, loop diuretics for patients with CKD, although these are the patients where you will find it most difficult to control ascites. Uh, that is our experience. This combination uh, where patient otherwise is child A and uh, means except for ascites, other parameters are okay. Then he has got uh, CKD stage three or four. These are the patients when they develop ascites, it is very, very difficult. And, and it's very difficult to justify doing a simultaneous liver kidney transplant also for them. So I agree with him that it, this is the most difficult group. If the patient is on dialysis, then uh, the first step is you rule out other causes of uh, ascites. I think that is very important. Very often you'll have tuberculosis or uh, you know hypothyroidism uh, related ascites. But intensification of dialysis is a good option for those patients who are on dialysis.
you have to fight with your nephrologist for do, to do that but you can okay right um, uh, there are two or three questions uh, by kapil dhingra from jaipur uh, dr doctor from chennai dr rajendra pal from mangalore regarding the management of cramps in a cirrhotic patient with ascites who is on diuretics it's not an uncommon experience and what do you do in these situations so uh, there are two reasons one is because of electrolyte imbalances and second is because of the hypovolemia itself the tissue hypo the tip, the tissue dehydration so i think uh, the first step is uh, if there are electrolyte imbalances you correct them uh, especially magnesium and potassium is what you need to correct uh, uh, in addition to sodium which almost always you would pick up uh, but if that does not uh, work then you have to actually reduce the dose of diuretics and uh, i Uh, my experience is a lot of time it is because the patient has consciously decreased the fluid intake when you have not advised so you allow them to listen to their thirst and drink accordingly and that helps a lot of these patients especially if they can just have a glass of uh, you know half a glass of water just before they go to sleep that sometimes solves the problem of night time cramps okay like very useful practical tips you mentioned um, aplirenone in uh, for uh, gynecomastia Uh, so is it available in india and if so under what brand name uh, and uh, cost etc is a dr anand gupta's question from jaipur so it is available in india uh, i unfortunately i don't think i'll take the brand names uh, in, in okay. a public forum but it's it's easily available the nephrologists are using it uh, very frequently the equivalent dose is what you need to remember it's twice as potent as uh, spironolactone so your dose should be half of that what you were using for spironolactone or spironolactone um, uh, dr rajendra pal mangalore again Uh, between torsemide and furosemide any preferences how often do you have to change from one to the from furosemide to torsemide so i think there is no literature to show the benefit of one over the other or uh, superiority of torsemide over furosemide so uh, i have not uh, very frequently uh, changed from one to the other the only benefit which at times i feel uh, i get is because of the more prolonged action of torsemide uh, you you can uh, get a more sustained effect that's that's the only thing uh, but i i really don't see a reason for me to switching over from one to the other right uh, bhavik shah calcutta he wants to know and it's an important question during follow up how how do you approach the question of stopping diuretics you put a patient with ascites on therapy ascites is mobilized now there is uh, nothing on ultrasound no fluid how do you go about do you would you stop and how do you uh, monitor these people so uh, the patients where i think of stopping uh, the diuretics completely is those patients where uh, the liver function has also improved simultaneously so alcoholics patients with hepatitis b patients with hepatitis c uh, in the but care when you have done tips so these are the patients where the liver function has improved so you would try uh, attempt to definitely stop if the liver function has not improved then I, even if the ascites has become dried completely i would usually maintain them on very small dose of diuretics but try to definitely come down to the minimum possible dose in everybody okay so i think um, last two questions Uh, Dr. Chinta Mori from Rajkot wants to know: Once a patient has recovered from diuretic diuretic induced AKI, how do you go about reintroducing diuretics in these people? I think excellent question. So the first thing which uh, you have to ensure is the patient is really euvolemic before you restart the diuretics. Uh, no postural hypotension, and I uh, means there are no guidelines on this. But what I usually do is I start off with a lower dose of diuretics than what I was using previously. uh usually it is half the dose and then uh, this time the escalation is much more slower and if it was a there was a additional cause for the aki then it is then i do tend to go back to the original dose but if the cause for aki was not there except for diuretics then uh, i would almost never go to the same dose again unless the liver function improves okay and finally how do you use a 24 hour urinary sodium monitoring for people on diuretics outpatients and versus inpatients refractory versus responsive ascites so uh, honestly speaking i don't use 24 hour urinary sodiums any longer the only time which i use now is if i'm looking for compliance uh, to uh, to dietary advice that is when i would look at 24 hour urinary sodium so if i have a high urinary sodium and the patient is still gaining weight then i know that the patient is uh, eating salt the other pl place is uh, when i have a patient with refractory ascites and if the urinary sodium is less than 30 then i know that the diuretics are not going to work so that is when i stop and of course whenever i have tried the safi safet that is when i always will do a urinary sodium 
Well, thank you very much, Akash. It's been really a wonderful afternoon session with a lot of questions answered and about 100 plus questions still left for you to answer, which uh, Yogita will be sending you tomorrow. And I think I'll hand over to Dr. Govind uh, for uh, his comments. Govind, please. Did Manoj have any question or uh, we go back? Only, only we have a, now 142. Manoj, you want to ask one or two questions or we close it? Because it's lunchtime on Sunday. So... 152 now questions, total number. Yes. So maybe we take two questions and then we, then we close. Yeah. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself. Yes. Okay. So uh, for how long metodrine should be used in patients with refractory ascites? That is a concern because it has some side effects also. Akash? Uh, yes, sir. So again, I think uh, I would always attempt to uh, reduce the dose we have data till six months. Uh, so for three to six months, I'm very comfortable using midodrine. Very often I've realized that if the liver function improves, which I think today, except for NASH, for most of the etiologies, you are able to ensure that the liver function sort of stabilizes over a period of time. So in those patients, you can actually attempt to, and that's my first drug, which I attempt to withdraw also because of the cost, uh, not only side effects, but cost also is a big constraint. But I don't have a, if you have a, do you have a figure in your mind beyond which you, you would not give? Six months or so? Yeah, exactly. Three to six months is what? Okay. Now, um, over to Professor Makaria for final comments. Okay. Uh, thank you. Sir. Uh, thank you viewers very much. And yes, it's so heartening that even at uh, 142, we have a tw more than 1200 uh, viewers this amount of time. So this is a really heartening. Uh, that's so that uh, the topic have been of quite interest uh, to all of us. Thank you, Akas, for making this uh, topic uh, so important. And you brought all the important points uh, which we you need to practice in our routine clinical practice. And that's the basic principle of a masterclass, that we want to make masterclass uh, into a change of practice uh, a kind, of, uh, uh, a kind of forum that we want to improve the clinical practice pattern in our society. And that's have been the focus. And you did... Uh, so wonderfully, uh, just wonderful justice on this uh, topic. Uh, thank you, Akas, again for a remarkable lecture today. Uh, thank you, sir, for giving the opportunity. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Manoj, for thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure to see you after such a long time, and thank you so much. Pleasure. Uh, today's audio was uh, probably I heard, we, we had a couple of feedbacks that uh, today's audio and video were not up to the mark in the initial part of the talk today. So, our apology. Certainly, we will go back to our technical team. I look at that why it happened probably sometimes it happens because of uh, uh, both at the uh, uh, speaker uh, uh, site and also sometimes at uh, other sites also certainly we'll look at uh, abilities and uh, uh, let me fix so that we don't have problem the next uh, uh, master class uh, the next lecture will be again next sunday again one of the Important topics of ability structure. How do you how do you approach a patient who has a ability, ability structure, both malignant and benign, but we focus on Sorry, go when your voice is also faded away. I can just so, say that again sir, that part of the next this will be uh, a talk on benign or benign ability structure. Now, uh, one more thing I want to remind you that uh, uh, IAS, I have IAS in 2020 in, in the month of December 19 and 20. That's a Saturday and Sunday. And for which we have already announced a call for abstracts. The abstract site is open and abstract will be submitted till 31st of August. Secondly, all those who are willing to submit papers for plenary session or young investigative award session, uh, please do send the full paper uh, by email and submit your abstract on the ISC abstract portal. Uh, we look forward to for your also. Uh, let me thank uh, uh, again Akas and uh, um, Dr. Manoj again for for this participation masterclass. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saraswat. Uh, we want to thank uh, Torrent Pharma for supporting. Uh, these uh, four master classes. Uh, thank you so very much. Uh, thank you, Denise, our technical 
a, a person uh, who have been very elegant in 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 telecasting or broadcasting our master class thank you yogita for all the coordination of these uh, master classes with that uh, we say bye bye for the day and we look forward to see you for next sunday on a yet another topic thank you again and